We will call the meeting to order at 6 o'clock p.m. if Darius is ready. Are we recording? He's nodding his head. We are, we are running. We are running. 6 o'clock. We have the review and approval of the minutes of January 6, 2021. First item on the agenda. Do I have any motion or anything? I'll move to approve the minutes. Okay. Second, Trevor. Any questions or comments? Not hearing any, I will ask for a roll call vote. <clears throat> Kenneth Cutterback, yes. David Sharp? Yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. Trevor McDaniel? Yes. This carries five nothing unanimous, unanimously. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is the financial statements and warrants discussion. I think Shelly had indicated that she didn't have anything dramatic to report. I don't know if she has anything else to say. Uh, nothing <laughs> to report for FY21 unless you have questions about the expense reports. Um, and if you want the warrant number on record, I'm happy to read that, Ken. But I did send that in an email to you for the notes. I, I can. I, I have seen that, and I will, I'm all set for that. Great. So the only question I had was, um, let's see, there were... Um, there was there was a couple of lines for uh, COVID nursing and uh, general COVID materials and supplies and stuff that weren't weren't spent yet. Were those just planning to be used at a certain time or or I didn't know? If, yeah, that, so we were using those accounts as sort of the placeholder to get purchase orders in the system until the town was reimbursing us. Yep. So if you look at that report right now, um, particularly this is under the school choice report I sent. So yes. the COVID nursing supplies has a $15,000 balance because everything we bought from that, the town reimbursed us for. Gotcha. Okay. So we won't use those funds moving forward unless there's something extraordinary that comes up that we can't fund from the general fund. Gotcha. There are a couple of things that did get expensed through school choice. There's $116 in the custodial supply line and then $1,600 in buildings general repairs. Those came in, those expenses occurred after we had sent the request to the town for yeah. reimbursement. Yeah. So we may be able to move those around so that they don't actually show up on school choice. But for the most yeah. part, anything COVID related at this point um, would not be hitting those lines. And, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned and, and that I know of from facilities, nursing and uh, from the school, Tina, directly, we're not buying anything right now, PPE wise or right. you know, materials were in good shape. Yeah. Great. Do you uh, do you have any other um, expenses coming over to the town, or are we wait as a town waiting on anything? Do you know? Um, not for deer. Although, wait, let me. I don't want to misspeak. We just yeah. got all the Chromebooks right last okay. week or the week before. So those bills, um, I'm in the process of reconciling, and that would be the last piece for Deerfield. Okay. Yep. And then there are some frontier stuff I'm still working on as well. Okay. All right. Good to know. Thank you. Um, and then the only other thing was the. Um, I noticed that, you know, I think the library and we just didn't have a librarian this year, right? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So we'd probably maybe move that up to the, um, I know that we were under, you know, overspending the classrooms and the IAs and stuff. I assume you balance that out somewhere else. Yeah, so. exactly. So savings from one line helps support overages yeah. in another. Okay. Absolutely. Perfect. That's all I got. Thank you. You're welcome. Very good. Thank you, Trevor. Yeah. Um, any other questions out there? Uh, seeing none, we will move along. Uh, public comment. I did not receive notification that we had any public comment this evening. So we will uh, move on down the agenda. Um, unfinished business, anti-racism, and equity committee update. Is there an update this evening, Darius? Or? Yep. It, it should be coming. Um, they, did do a, they did have a change last minute to... Uh, uh, Jameson Isler is going to be on, um, and so I, I don't know why he's on. You know, I'll shoot him a note. Okay. All right. That would be great. So 
Jameson is a rep or? He's a co-chair of the uh, Anti-Racism Equity Committee. Ah, great. Is he on faculty now or? Um, I think he teaches in Northampton. Okay, that's what I, the last I knew he was teaching down in Northampton, so. We lost Darius. Nope. Oh, there he is. <laughs> we can. Uh, you're talking, Gary. You're muted. <clears throat> I realized right now that they did a change of the presenter today, and in passing, someone said I had to send him the link, and I never did it until right this moment. So, okay, we'll, we'll wait patiently, and hopefully, he's double checks his email instead of saying right before the meeting, "I don't have the link. I'm not going to go." Right. <laughs> <laughs> if not, I, I can give a very basic overview that I, uh, I can give a very basic overview, but let's hope sure. yeah. he's watching and makes the adjustment. Oops, that's a goof. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> I could go into COVID update and we can. That would be, a, the, my next step was going to say, why don't we move to a COVID-19 update? All right, um, where we are there is the two kind of things I have under COVID-19 is the um, pool testing. I kind of gave you an overview of that last time, um, if I remember. And right now, um, basically what's going on with the state is the state got us to sign up, but they are rolling it out really slow in providing information and that kind of stuff. We just found out we're supposed to start on Monday where that's the first day window you're allowed to start. We found out today who our provider is. And so now we're trying to get from the provider the release forms in order to get those out to families, to get the people to sign on. And we're not even sure if we're gonna be able to get the product in time. And I haven't really heard an explanation as to if they really thought the rollout was going to occur over four days in these school systems. So um, it was, I think two weeks ago when they were talking about how they were rolling out, we are like, wow, they're really rolling this slowly. They're gonna wait. They're giving us information like one week at a time. Um, so realistically, I don't think it's going to start next week. Um, I've been kind of going along. Um, I said at last night's meeting, so this is an update from yesterday to today, that we're going to try to do some sort of um, we're going to try to do some trial run of whatever we could, um, whatever we're allowed. You know, just try to get it going prior to break, so that we can come back from break and have it rolling. Now it probably looks like we probably won't actually do the actual testing, but we may do a dry run of a practice run, like a fire drill, so to speak, um, doing practice nose swabbing, so the kids can get the, as the administrators say, get the giggles out and kind of see like what is this really going to take to. Can kids really self-administer it instead of live on the actual day, doing it with Q-tips and that kind of stuff, and also bringing down any anxieties that students may have, and just kind of do everybody the fun way, and then we'll see what what kids we can get, make sure we try to get everybody to sign up to do it. So that's kind of where we're at now. Um, I kind of, that is where we're at now. Um, any questions on overall on pool testing and that kind of thing? So the one other part is the, the state will pay for it for six weeks. Now it'll be five weeks. I doubt they're going to change that end date, but that was a question that was asked to me that since they didn't get rolled out in time, will they give us an extra paid week? I'm going to guess no, because I bet you this is a big financial, you know, the companies that are doing it are probably doing it at a discount because they got the, they got the ins to the schools by being selected to be the major providers. Um, but we'll see. Um, but I am going to come back. I'm going to get feedback from, you know, faculty, nursing, administrators, um, and then eventually come back to you folks because it is going to cost us money. Um, the remaining 11 weeks for Deerfield, um, back of the envelope number that Shelly put together is about seventeen, about $18,000. That's before we remove teachers. Um, you know, teachers would be removed, you know, hopefully we can get vaccinated over the next six weeks. It's hopefully the game plan. So, um, so I think really what we're going to look at is really how effective is it? Does it really change our, did it, did it change the safety level of the building? Um, you know, also looking at, do we need to do everybody? Maybe we do partial groups when we rotate every other week, you know, also looking at what does Franklin County look like? So it's, you know, I want to go into it having this conversation because I also really want to believe that 
you know, it's hard to say no to community testing. Some communities have. Um, I felt it was hard to say no for a free community testing because well, the other side is once you start doing it and you take it away, then I'm saying right from the beginning that we may take it away because we may not find it as beneficial. Um, or as, cost effective. What's that? Or cost effective. Or cost effective to what it really does. And um, I think when we remove, one of the other questions about COVID is, so, you know, is vaccination. So vaccinations around the other corner, around the corner. Um, I really want to thank, um, I really want to thank Carolyn Nestros, who really has been constant contact with me. And of course, Trevor, who's also on the board of health, but Carolyn's been really kind of leading the efforts on vaccination and she really is prioritizing getting the teachers in. Um, and so hopefully that's going to happen in the next few weeks. Um, and the next question after that is what is this, how does that change what we're going to be delivering for a school model? Um, that obviously we've got to do the first vaccination and the second vaccination. So you're really talking still two months away. Um, <laughs> Right now we're looking at, we're going to be masked through the end of the year, just because you get vaccinated doesn't mean you can stop wearing a mask. And then comes the question about what we're going to do with students um, who are, there's not going to be a student vaccination at least until summer um, and then the full rollout probably going into the fall. And so we're going to have to look for you know, really DPH guidance about what does this mean for schools and really looking at, you know, I think we're going to have to Hopefully, you can open up with open eyes looking at data. What is the effect of you know students under the age of eighteen in COVID? You know, what is the you know how you know what is the uh, uh, complications those you know they've seen? What does the data show about how susceptible they are to having really adverse um, complications to having COVID? Um, right now, you know, as you know, anecdotally and then just based on some basic research, saying that it hasn't been that effective, but hasn't affected them very badly, but I don't know, I don't have the crunch data. And so I think as a school committee and as a kind of a state, we're gonna be looking for that data. And then how do we change? Do we, you know, do we change from a six to three foot, which is already in the DESE recommendation, but we we, we said just the six feet, you know, because the problem we're gonna have is we can only take so many more students back to the current model at Deerfield. Um, and so if, as people get vaccinated, wherever that timeline is, and people are gonna to wanna to get back in person, I hope, um, this year, we're gonna we're gonna have some challenges ahead. And so they're good challenges in the sense of that, we're not gonna be having the challenges of like we had six months ago about people's lives, you know, being at risk and how do we keep people safe and that kind of stuff. It's gonna be more how uh, the other shifts of how do we do this moving forward, um, still safely, I guess. So it's not just that. So that's kind of a, I kind of started the verbal, too much there. Um, any questions on anything I've said? <laughs> no, I agree. We should yeah. evaluate it before we, you know, sign up for seventeen thousand dollars worth of testing. Um, I'm, I'm not surprised that it's rolling out slow. The state's just been slow on everything: uh, the planning, the implementation, the vaccines, all of that. It's been a battle. So, thank you. It has. It's been slower rollout, and um, I said that last night. The, the the question of whether or not Eastern Mass is getting more doses than Western Mass, you know, I don't know. I don't know the statistical fight there, but is it has to do with population versus, you know, are we red enough? Are we, you know, that kind of stuff, those yeah. kind of things, um, you know. So I don't know the details there. I do know that we're getting, you know, some more in the next few weeks, and then hopefully the pipeline will open up even more um, to get us there. Um, well, the, it is a nationwide problem right now, so it's a, it's certainly a fine illustration of how dysfunctional our medical care and healthcare system can be in this country. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's insane. <clears throat> and the most money, so, too. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, okay. Well, given that we're not seeing Jameson online yet, um if he, if he pops up he pops up we'll uh we'll cut in but i do want to get to shelly and the uh fy22 budget proposal discussions uh she sent out a a summary of uh budget proposal um concerns and thoughts and so i will turn it over at this point in time i think <laughs> um <laughs> 
Darius, do you want to share? There's some pretty big feedback. I don't know where it's coming from, but maybe it was Darius. Um, I think Darius is going to share his screen <laughs> so that everyone and you all can see the report that I sent out. I did send it later this afternoon. Um, and it's going to kind of guide our discussion. Uh, so the first page here that you can see is just a reminder of what the current year's budget is and then what the one to 5% increases look like just to refresh memory. Um, and then if we scroll down a little bit, uh, I did update a draft two. Um, in the draft two, uh, the reason that that's slightly reduced from 7.29 to 7.12 is because the um, estimated retirement payout that I had in for a retiree that will have to be paid in 22, uh, the actual is going to be less than what I had in the original draft. So I made that adjustment, brought us down really <laughs> very little, but wanted to account for that in here. Um, and again, the most significant increases for us are related to school lunch wages and early childhood wages, given that we really don't have any revenue to count on for next year um, for those two programs. So administration talked and, you know, we kind of wanted to go into this with at least an idea to start the conversation about how to bring that number down because we do recognize that 7% um, or over 7% is really not probably feasible. Um, Deerfield doesn't have a lot of other pools of money other than school choice to pull from. Um, so we use that as the starting point here after looking at the current budget. So in the current budget, there is about $90,000 worth of savings that I anticipate at the end of the year that we will not spend. That number could grow because I didn't look at every single line yet, um, but there are uh, savings and staffing. Um, we've talked about this several times. Tina didn't replace two special education teachers, the librarian. Uh, there was a clerical position that was um, a leave of absence for the year. Uh, we have reductions in transportation costs because of the negotiations that we went through with the transportation contract. So even though, as Trevor pointed out, some of the expenses are up because we hired additional staff this year or there were changes that created overages in some accounts, even with um, offsetting those overages, we're still looking at about 90000 in savings. So the recommendation would be to take that savings money, move over the school choice expenses, just like we did last year when we froze the budget, to free up those, free up those funds in school choice next year. And we would use that $90,000 to pay additional expenses for next year to help bring down that 7% increase. Um, so that would be, it's not an increase in revenue in school choice, it's really just moving the pots of money around from where our expenses are paid from, putting it into choice, and then taking it right back out next year as an expenditure. Um, and then the other three pieces here are also same thing, uh, school choice repetitive. Darius, can you slide down a tiny bit just so we can see what number four looks like? Oh, too far. That's fine. You can leave it there. It's okay. <laughs> Um, so we have the retirement expense, um, school lunch wages, and then we had to add an additional IA to the draft budget this year because our funding source for the special education revolving account, if you recall from our initial discussion, that revenue is going down. So we had to move an IA over. Um, so it would be my recommendation that we use school choice funds to pay for these expenses. Um, retirement is built in right now into the budget, as are these other pieces. But if we move these three things off, again, help bringing that 7.12 down. Um, so if we look at the chart now, scroll down a little bit, I'll show you what that financial picture looks like. Um, so backing out the 90000 that we're going to move to school choice from this year's savings, the twenty two the school lunch wages and the IA wages, we'd be down to a 3.66% increase if we were to utilize school choice funds to cover all of these expenses. Now, we can't do that without looking at what the impact to school choice would be because this is a lot of additional cost on school choice over what we already have allocated to be spent from school choice. So the next chart shows uh, what that bottom line would be. Um, you can see here the draft two projection, uh, going into the year, what we're looking at, where the end of the year would be about eight eight hundred thousand, um, the ninety thousand. You can see I've added to the the funding. Um, we have our revenue of two seventy four. Our expenses increased by ninety thousand, but because we added the ninety and we're taking it out, the net result is the same in this first uh, second column. 
So the third column adds in the retirement expense, and then the fourth column adds in the school lunch and the IA wages. So you can see at the end of the year, with all of these changes, we're significantly reducing. We're dropping from 819,000 to 741,000. So that's a significant change. Um, there are expenses that really aren't going to go away. Uh, we'd be looking at having them the following year with the exception of the retirement expense right now. Um, I can't remember if there's anyone scheduled to be paid out in 23, but that's really the only one that would be um, possibly coming off. So that's the sort of discussion that we have to have tonight. Um, and if we go to the next page, um, it leads into that. You know, we've been using school choice funds to supplement the local budget, and that's completely acceptable. Um, however, the capacity and the amount of expenses on school choice has certainly increased. Um, but at the same time, Deerfield's revenue from school choice is going down. In 2018, the revenue from school choice enrollments was over 500,000. In fiscal year 20, it was only 340,000. And in 21, we're looking at just shy of 275,000. So we're significantly reducing. And I think, you know, I obviously wasn't here all of those years, but what what I remember from last year and in, in conversations with Tina is that we sort of made a cognitive decision about some of the class sizes and how many school choice students we were taking. Um, but it might be time to reconsider that and expand a little bit knowing the challenges that we're facing because we can't continue to have expenses that are exceeding our revenue. It's just not sustainable long term. Um, so using the school choice funds that I outlined above, that will reduce the local budget increase, but it really only helps the situation for one year. We would be looking to have to add those expenses back into local budget in 23, or if we kept them on school choice, um, the impact is pretty significant. So I did do you know, some quick math. If the revenue stayed the same and the expenses stayed as we projected them with the additions from this year, we'd be looking at only um, $429,000 as an ending balance at the end of FY23. So we'd be losing another 312,000. So we're cutting in a year. Right now we're looking at at the end of this year having just over 800,000 dropping to 400,000 and a little bit more um, in another you know, two fiscal years, so 22 to 23. And it's really not feasible, you know, so we wanted to present you an option of how to bring that budget down without having to start talking about programmatic or personnel cuts, um, but wanted to present a realistic picture of what that looks like moving forward and how we have to start thinking long term. Um, some of our hardship is related directly to COVID. You know, we've got $130,000 in wages that we've never had to pay for before. Um, so, you know, it, it's a challenge this year, it's gonna be a challenge next year, and maybe in a couple of years, the early childhood program and the school lunch will have righted itself in a way that we're in a better position and we can move some funds back to those revolving, revolving accounts, maybe even one year from now, but I expect it'll take us several before we get there. Um, any questions on any of that before I keep going? Shelly, I got a question. Um, yep. Could you explain a little bit about the, the preschool tuition issue and, and, and why that's expected to be down for a long period of time? Well, so we don't know what preschool is going to look like next year. And right now, uh, we have very little revenue coming in because our class sizes were decreased with COVID-19. Um, a lot of families decided not to enroll for preschool and or we didn't have the capacity to take them. So our revenue this year has been impacted. And we actually had to shift some things around um, this year to make all of the finances work for salaries and wages because our staffing didn't decrease um, because we're still serving a significant special needs population with a few um, tuition paying children in the program. So in the fall, which we have no information on right now what DESE is going to allow us to do for class sizes to know if we're going to be able to expand and or um, if our families you know, in the community are going to want to come back to preschool or not. So without knowing those numbers, um, I think we have to plan to have the salaries and wages paid for from another funding source. And I think even if we can increase capacity for next year, we're not going to instantly get back up to those hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue that we were bringing in. Um, it might be enough to offload an IA or maybe if we're lucky a teacher, but I don't foresee us going from 
twenty thousand in revenue this year to a hundred thousand plus. Do you? And I know you've been around um, <clears throat> that many cycles, but do you have any historical reference to what um, the preschool revenue used to be when it? Um, when I can at started? least tell you. Yeah, let me just pull up quickly what uh, I have in here from. I have the 1920 school year and our revenue in uh, 1920. Was uh, projected to be just shy of 300,000 and we ended up taking almost a $70,000 loss because of COVID last spring when we basically weren't charging tuition. Um, so almost 300,000 plus we were receiving a grant in Deerfield, which that grant actually ended last year. That was a $35,000 multi-year grant that ended. So that was an additional impact to the preschool program. Um, and then our expenditures were less than 200,000 um, last year. And again, you know, it, it last year's not the best example because of COVID, but we certainly were making more than we were spending, which allowed us if we had any unforeseen special education costs in preschool, or if we needed to add a one-to-one -one teacher, as an example, um, we had some reserves to do that. And right now we've, we've basically depleted any reserves that we had. Um, we went into this year with very little money rolling over. And in a typical year, we might've had, you know, 30,000 to roll over something along those lines. So, okay, but, but those numbers are pretty, I mean, the program's pretty well known. And so when you talk about this, um, you know, going on year to year, it seems like we shouldn't be thinking of it as being a problem for multiple years, right? If, if, the, if you're talking about revenue of two, 300,000 in the preschool program, um, well, we've had a significant reduction in enrollment, and no, Tina, Tina, I don't know if um, Amy has given you any numbers yet. I don't have them yet of what your current applications are or what the fall applications look like. Do you have any info on that at this point? I don't have them yet, but I'm not sure if that's what David's asking. I think he's saying, like, historically, if we're up and running and COVID isn't... Um, impacting our space, we would be looking at gaining um, the $300,000 again tuition like in two or three years. Is that what you're saying, David? I, I guess I'm, what I'm, yeah, so what I'm hearing is that there's a, a hit in the budget, the way we're looking at it, of about $100,000 um, that, that the school choice theoretically is gonna go you know, down by related to the preschool program because of the lack of revenue. And I'm, and I'm just saying that it seems like we shouldn't be, and, and, and Shelly, you appropriately being conservative and saying, oh no, you know, we can't have school choice going down this amount, that's not sustainable, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it seems to me that it's not gonna go down, it's obviously not gonna go down the same rate that we're expecting to maybe have it go down next year, the following year. I mean, I mean the preschool has to bounce back at some level, doesn't it? It, it will. I think it's probably going to be 2024 before we see any real numbers in the sense that we're back up to 200 and 300,000 for capacity again with the number of kids that we have enrolled. So I do think that this is a multi-year problem. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I just, I can't imagine we're going to be able to um, bring in enough kids to increase our revenue that much not definitely not in 22 maybe in 23 but you know that'll be further discussions we have to have down the road um you know we don't we don't, go ahead David, I hear what you're saying. Though, with David, I understand exactly what you're saying we're saying well it's not as bleak as you're really saying it because we're going to get some revenue you're absolutely correct but we have to use school choice to offset that until we get that revenue if next fall comes and we still have to have classroom sizes that are reduced, and um, you know, obviously we, we have to do those, those those students with special needs first, who are not going to be paying. You know, there's a lot of factors that we have to be able to foot the bill first on that. So we have to really come in conservative because if we don't, then you know, we're we're you know, I mean, you're you're not having your you're having to spend the money. From the, from the reserves anyways. Mm -hmm. 
and not being upfront about it. But I hear what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I, I think Shelly's accurate too in that, you know, people's, um, they have made accommodations this year and, and sometimes that, that might mean another preschool thing where they would normally have come here. Um, they may be just settled into another facility or some other choice now for that, those years that we normally would have them. So even though if everything gets better next year, they just may not come back because they're comfortable where they are or, um, you know, and, and it's just going to, I think it's going to take longer than we think to get all of those, all of that revenue back. I just, the, think, you know, I think Trevor, you're absolutely correct. If you, if you, if you started a preschool, a private preschool program, cause they couldn't get into our public one this year or the private program was allowing more ch child care than mm -hmm. we were able to do it certainly at the beginning of the year. Um, they, you're right. All of a sudden they know the teacher, they got a comfort level and why change mm -hmm. for one year when, you know, you know, to get over here for one year before they come to kindergarten. So yeah. um, it's a good point. And we don't well, know what those numbers are going to be. Yeah. Um, I think these are all good points on the, the um, you know, the preschool question. David, thank you for bringing them up. Um, but I think one thing we might consider is not necessarily defraying a lot of the excess expense in the preschool and carry it in the budget and maybe a slightly higher percentage increase and say to the board of selectmen and the finance committee look we have a choice here we can you know we can probably defray it and we have to see what the town budget looks like too mm -hmm. um, but we can probably help defray it with school choice but we prefer to present it this way because school choice is going away rapidly and we're not going to have it to fall back on we have to start getting these things into the budget and that and, and if we can't do it um then then we're going to have to look at the hard hard decisions in, not necessarily this year but in in years ahead if you know if the select board and finance committee don't come to understand it so um i think it's you know an important conversation to have. can can we sort of table for one minute on preschool i noticed that jameson has signed in um, and maybe we could go and get get his piece done and taken care of and uh go from there Jameson. Good Jameson you. Miss yeah. committee. Welcome back. <laughs> unmute. <laughs> this is a very familiar conversation. Um, I feel like I, I feel like it's just been a month since I've been there. Um, <laughs> hello, old friends and, and new friends. Uh, it's good to see you all. I'm here to give you a quick report on what's going on with the uh, combined uh, race and social justice committees and initiative. Um, so, you know, we didn't report out in January because things were really, we had just gotten back when it was time for the meeting. Uh, so this is kind of a, it's kind of a, I don't know, like a, a, a seven week report, right? Um, it's February, it's Black History Month, so we'll start there. Um, there's been a resource list sent out to all schools. Um, most responses have been from elementary teachers who, who are really excited to, to use those resources in the classroom. Um, there's a discussion with one of the committees of a district read slash watch of uh, Ms. Gorman's inaugural poem, um, the, road we, the Hill We Climb, um, and thinking about using the last few lines as a focus for, this, for the next semester with some questions around that, those lines, like what does it mean to be the light? How can we be the light? Um, and, and we're reporting that um, many teachers have already incorporated the poem into their classes as a part of, of lessons. Um, at the end of the month. Uh, from the school culture subcommittee, uh, peer leaders have led two open discussions with groups, open discussion groups with, with about 30 participants each time. Uh, feedback from students have been very positive. And the theme for February is privilege and intersectionality. Uh, at the high school, they'll be unveiling the new logo by the end of February and uh, planning a series of articles in the recorder, starting with the logo and expanding to the other actions we're taking with the focus on student voices. Uh, and we're looking for elementary voices to, to be included in that. Um, um, elementary professional development. The, the elementary schools are working with Amanda Mosea, Romina Pacheco and S Safar Dijon uh, from the collaborative who are serving as anti-racist education cult consultants this term. 
Also, this term, the elementary schools are focusing on revamping their curricula to be more culturally responsive, representative, inclusive, and social justice oriented. Um, young people have the power to make change. This is using a tool developed from New York University. Working in small groups, uh, teachers and staff are analyzing the curriculum, their assessments, and their disciplinary practices, trying to weed out bias. There are three optional PD sessions where grade bands will go through one unit of their ELA curriculum. There will be four or five PD sessions where grade bands will go through one unit of their social studies curriculum. And using guidance questions based off of the NYU tool, school psychologists, librarians, music teachers, art teachers, and physical education teachers will be guided through analyzing and revamping their curricula and assessment slash referral practices. Uh, in terms of the high school PD, it resumes on March 3rd. Um, the high school is reading a, a book called Is Everyone Really Equal by Robin D'Angelo and Oslam Sinsoy, and they're continuing workshops with uh, Radical Empathy Consulting from UMass. Um, the curriculum subcommittee reports out that the high school is offering African-American studies next year, and the peer leadership group will officially be a class called Media, Activism, and Social Change. We're hoping to incorporate visits to the elementary schools as a part of this class. And finally, from the policy and procedure subcommittee, um, we got results from our survey on the response to microaggressions and incidents of racism. There's a clear need for more uh, professional development on identifying microaggressions and a need for a more streamlined universal policy on incident response, perhaps similar to the district policy on bullying. Uh, and the school culture subcommittee has discussed how these incidents could also inform changes to curriculum. For example, uh, we had an incident with the Confederate flag. A short term solution is to respond specifically to that incident and the students involved, but the long term solution is to implement more lessons on the history of the Confederate flag and the Confederacy and ed an education around why it is a racist symbol. And so that's the official report. The unofficial report is, um, you'll recall, I left the committee when my child finished sixth grade. She's a senior this wow. year. So um, it's been a while since I've seen you all in this capacity. It's good to see you again and um, keep up the good work. It's, and it's great seeing you, Jameson. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. I know, I know we bump into each other occasionally around town, but uh, it's it's nice to see your face here at the school committee once again. So right. and thank you for your work with our um, you know with the with this whole effort and uh, serving as co-chair. That's uh, that's a lot of work to take on. We appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Take so, care, everybody. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Okay. So thank. So we're back to Shelley again. <laughs> yeah, Darius, do you want to sh share your screen again? And I'll go through those last couple of points on the um, document before we further the discussion, um, which they sort of go along with what uh, David was saying. Um, so number two that I have listed on here is, you know, alternate options for you all to consider and for us to discuss. Um, freezing the budget for 21, which we have not done at this point, but that would allow us to capture additional savings to help support next year. Again, it's a short-term solution, um, doesn't really help us the following year, but would address um, next year without having to make any cuts in programs or personnel. Um, I think Ken just mentioned this, submitting a larger budget increase to the town. Um, and really opening up a conversation with them about the challenges that we face as a school this year. And then, um, you know, the most popular for any of us to talk about would be a reduction in personnel and or programming. Um, and then the last, there's three more points actually. Um, the early childhood, we could have increased revenue next year. Um, the longer that we have in the budget process, the more information that we'll know. Um, so if we see that preschool enrollment is going to increase, DESE's restrictions loosen, um, you know, obviously we can at them, that point start talking about moving wages back to the revolving fund. Um, but I would caution us to tread lightly there because it's unpredictable what that looks like at this point. Um, same applies for school lunch, which I know is a much smaller number as far as wages go. Um, but if 
lunches are no longer free for everyone and we're back to some type of normalcy as far as sc serving school lunches, we may have some increased revenue there, which would um, possibly back some of that 30,000 in school lunch wages off of the local budget. Again, too early to say right now if that um, waiver of free lunches for all will be extended. Um, and then the last piece here is um, we have heard about some additional state funding for uh, CARES Act, and uh, I'm hoping to get more information. Friday, the state has a webinar uh, Desi's put out for business managers and um, other administrative staff, and there could be some additional funds there that we can help supplement. But again, one-year solutions, you know, that's a funding right. source that right. wouldn't be there long term, so it would help us get through next year, but we're going to have the same conversations, I predict, the same time next year. So, okay. Uh, thank you, Shelly. I I just have a a couple of questions. Um, one is that I think there are a couple positions that were not filled this year. Um, and we we added others, obviously, but we have a couple positions that weren't filled. They were special education positions, if I'm not mistaken. And if we say we return to some semblance of normalcy. Or normality, depending on who you listen to on the on the uh, news conferences. Um, what would be the status or need, or where would those positions fit into the overall picture? <laughs> would they still be needed? I guess is my question. I defer to you, <laughs> Tina. I'm going to leave it to I, Tina. I'm sorry, I should have addressed it to Tina. It's okay. I just saw Shelly unmute, so I wasn't sure if she was going to address that. Well, the librarian position, we um, we would need a librarian position, but we could look mm -hmm. at alternate ways to staff the library. So those are some of the things that we're thinking of, like an instructional assistant position could staff the library if we needed to reduce it there. Um, special ed wise, there's two special ed liaisons in the budget um, that we didn't fill last year, we could look at um, not filling one of those positions and using our resources within. So there's some room for um, budget savings. Okay. All right. And thank you. Um, and that was kind of my question as to what what um, what positions would we be starting to look at if we had to uh, write this ship for the long term? I mean, we can move some stuff to the um, you know, to the town and see what the town's appetite is for it. I mean, they did, you know, they, the, the impetus of the finance committee was to reduce school choice, right? It was to kind of, why are we spending all this money in three classes when we, you know, so this is the consequence of doing that and streamlining. But now that we've streamlined, are, are we top heavy in staff? Is there, is there areas that we still need to, um, you know, what are the hard choices? What 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 do we have to look at to get back into a normal, steady um, amount? Or is it somewhere in between where we do need to go up and we also need to reduce a little bit to find a, a happy medium there? Um, so. yeah. Yeah. I think it gets difficult when you, when we talk about staff reduction, so what you never want to do is get into like kind of like, oh, we can pick from here, we can pick from right. here. So in, you know, my kind of experience in through the years of even as, as principal, you you look at it, you try to find like what's the number you want us to kind of be closer to. I mean, I also know if you don't have staff that's needed, obviously you got to trim that out as well. But something like a librarian, you know, you know, is it is an instrumental part of a of a school? Right. You know, it's something that we could cut back on, as Tina just said, and put an IA in, but then you, you're missing, you're not having the full resources of a library. And so there are different values within that, but I think it's also has to do, depends on what number you're trying to reach, about how far do you go into those values, you know? And mm -hmm. so I guess, I guess that gets kind of dangerous for us to just kind of, overall, what can you get away with, can we cannot with in a public meeting? I think what we probably want with direction of like, how do you reduce? And we also don't know what our programming is for next year. Right. That's, I guess that's kind of the huge thing. We also could have a problem where we need a. We went down to two preschool classrooms. What if we have to go up to a third one? Right. You know what I mean. And so, um, you know, those kind of things are um, those kind of shifts that we're having overall as well. So it's a different kind of. I think we have to come back to a different format of when we talk about staff reductions. Um, 
you know, we can do kind of an overview about what it can look like, but it also got to kind of give us gears to a number. But I think it's, I, I agree with what you said. There probably has to be a balanced approach. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to have, I think we're going back with David said, well, we're going to get some revenues next year. Right. You know, or, or things that really knock on well for society. Right. Okay. Um, so we're going to get some revenues there. We may need to make some reductions and we may have to use some more school choice that we're more comfortable with. And maybe that's kind of what we're, Agreed. it's kind of what the, the simple kind of look of yes. collective is going forward. Yep. And, I agree with that. And we also are in this situation. I mean, I, my, my heart goes out to the, to the administrative team on this and Shelly in particular, because we have no idea what our enrollments are going to look like. Uh, our enrollments are skewed this year. Uh, I believe, and and uh, you know, depending on how things progress over the summer in the state, how many people are going to come back, and you know, will that throw things out of whack for us? Uh, you know, we'll plan based on numbers that we have this year, possibly, and maybe do some, you know, thinking on possible additional increases in uh, resident enrollment, but you know, to have any idea what we can offer as school choice slots, how many classes we're going to have per grade. I mean, I think we had an extremely small kindergarten class this year, did we not? Um, so um, if that's the um, you know, population moving into first grade, we're back to the situation we had four years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And Tina will be pulling even more of her hair out than she has been this year. So uh, I, I think that this is the information we've gotten tonight is good. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'd like to get a sense from the committee. Do we, do we want to use this much school choice or do we maybe want to bump a half a percent or a percent and maybe only take care of the, you know, the school lunch and the, um, the other items and the, the early childhood and the revolving fund issues, um, maybe some of that goes into the budget just so the town can be made aware of what, what we're wrestling with. Um, I, I'd rather not take 50% of the school choice, you know, reserve that we have, mm -hmm. um, if we can avoid it. I, I think we were trying to work it out such that we would be moving these expenses back into the regular budget that may be, you know, 50 or 100 or $150,000 a year to try and get it back off of school choice so that we weren't, you know, eroding it quite so. And this is uh, obviously we didn't predict COVID, right. um, but this is certainly a much faster erosion of school choice funds than we had uh, been trying to plan for. So I don't know. I, I'll turn it over. I'll stop talking. <laughs> Shelly, can I ask you uh, sort of a, just back up a little and just a broader question? What what is the percentage increase in the budget that is related just to contractual uh, increases for staff? Do you know roughly? Go. You're muted. on mute, Shelly. You're muted. Still muted. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I hit it. <laughs> Probably uh, somewhere around three and a half we'd be looking at for an increase, maybe closer to four with, you know, adding in some extra needs. But, you know, a big chunk of this is related to we've got, you know, a hundred and fifty thousand dollars of expenses that we normally, which is three percent almost um, okay. that we normally we wouldn't we did, wouldn't have planned for without some COVID issues. Uh, okay, hold on. So that what I was really asking. Leo, good. I think he's talking about contra contractual yeah, obligations, just, the increases in salaries, Shelley. Any idea approximately what can be attributed in, in a percentage basis? Yeah, the challenge with that is that not all of the salaries hit the local budget because some of them are paid from school choice. But let me um, pull up the faculty page. So overall, um, by the way, that was a dog, not a child I was talking to. So let me clear. 
<laughs> with this group. <laughs> Just in case it sounded harsh. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have that exact number, David. I can be more prepared for that and follow and up okay. in an email. Yeah, um, okay. no but, you know, if we're looking at 7.2 and we back out the 3% of these extra things that we would have had paid from revolving funds, you know, we're down around 4% for what our increase would have been our starting point. And right. that would include COLA, that would include central office increases, insurance increases, those kind of pieces. Mm -hmm. So. You know, if we take out those extra things, our budget probably would have started around a 4%. Mm -hmm. I, I just raise it just because it's always sort of a, it seems like an important thing to keep in mind when we struggle about the percentage increases that we want to ask the town to pay when there's not a lot of discretionary, um, mm -hmm. you know, right. discretionary stuff. We're already well over often um, an amount that we're comfortable asking the town. And so we end up looking for either places to cut or uh, going to school choice. Uh, but if I could just talk on the flip side now, not to be a pessimist, but I, I think that we, when we're having this debate, we all need to realize, especially the ones who have been here for a while, that, that the um, school choice number that we are dealing with now is much more in reserve than we all thought we had for Correct. all the years up till about two or three years ago. Clearly somebody was, there was a bit of an error going on, and it's, it's a good error, right? Um, but we often, we were always operating under the assumption that we were sort of had, you know, it was somewhere between high 400s to 500,000 that we were, um, we had going year to year. So I just think we need to be honest with our, not that we're being dishonest, but we need to keep that in mind that we have a, a much larger cushion. And so if, there, if this is determined to be the year where there is such a need, um, it's not so drastic. On mm -hmm. the other hand, rate of decrease goes the way it is obviously it's a big problem but yeah. but there is a bit of a cushion I, yeah i just think that um pardon me for jumping in but i i just think that we we run a risk if we i mean and admittedly this is an extraordinary year but if we don't at least alert the finance committee and the board of selectmen to the issue and say this is going to bite us in another two years or, you know, two, maybe three, one, two, three years, whatever. I, I don't think if we, I think if we don't run it up the flagpole and, and raise the awareness and start to try and move some expenses, even if it's just a token, um, mm -hmm. then uh, we're really going to face something in another two or three years as a, as a community in terms of being able to support the educational services that the town is, you know, that the school community and the town has come to expect. So, I mean, that's that's sort of why I was saying what I was saying. Yeah. And, and then the other point about enrollment is a big one, isn't it? Because we are serving, and I know a lot of it's associated with the preschool, and so you kind of have to take that number out, I think. But even if we look at just one through, sorry, K through six, compare, you know, the last school year to this year, it's down like, I mean, is it 50 kids? Is it 40 or 30? It's a Definitely. fair amount of kids, and we have this, and we've obviously increased the budget year over year. Right. So at some point, that issue is needs to be raised. And people tonight have mentioned, well, are we are we going to start filling up again on school choice, um, or is there a point that we have to go a different direction? Just given that enrollment is is so low, I mean, it'd be great to teach a class with 10 kids. We'd all love that if we could support that. Um, <laughs> But I don't, but it's going to be a tough <clears throat> sell, I think. Mm -hmm. I so, think you're right. Again, again, if, if you know, if we, it's, a, it's a large percentage of the students that's decreased and the budget is, has not decreased accordingly. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not saying it should have, but I'm saying that if that continues, it's a problem. And maybe we don't know some of that stuff until the summer, but that's a problem. Right. So if we took, um, you know, if we're figuring about 3% of this increase is something that we'd normally cover because of revenue coming in, and we are about a 4% increase, you know, this year, plus or minus before we get into it too hard, um, you know, we had no increase last year. So there, you know, there are some, um, you know, this is kind of, we held off for a year and and this is kind of where it's coming to bite us a little bit. And it's, you know, you're having to pay th those costs still come up every year. We just kind of 
ate them and held on to them. But so I think we're seeing a larger increase than we normally would if we were going up each year. We held off last year. So I think if we can make some adjustments here and there, like um, Ken said, not not to eat all this up, but to to kind of share some of the town, you know, look look at the positions, um, look at school choice and do a balanced approach. We might be able to, um, you know, to pull something off again, just to hold hold over for another year to see if these revenues can come back and we get back to normal, of you know, selling lunches and uh, supporting those positions and also you know, ha have some students come back and some school choice come back. It's a it's a wonderful school community. So people are always going to want to come here. And I think it's important to remember that what you just kind of said is last year, and maybe we can look at it now and say, well, maybe we shouldn't have done it this exactly this way. But we went into our crisis year by doing a zero percent increase, but didn't mean we didn't increase our budget. Right. You know what I mean? And right. so we, we didn't reduce services because we needed as many bodies as possible in order to do a dual model. Yeah. And okay. therefore we paid for it at a choice, which was really at a savings. Yep. Choice revenue didn't go up. We just took our savings, put it into choice and then paid for it at a choice. Um, so now this year comes along and we're spending that when we paid for the previous year on choice. I think we all know it. I'm just kind of saying, oh, yep. wow. Yep. Um, so now you really do have a double year unless you reduce services, right. unless you reduce your budget. And the only way you're gonna really be able to reduce budget is is service personnel, um, yep. you know, uh, or program, program personnel. So um, I think we do have to start looking at enrollment and kind of line that up to see where we are at. And if our, if our enrollment does reach the kind of the close to what last year's numbers were, we're, you know, within, you know, looking at, at how it lands as well, then we may be asking more money from the town because we, we did do a hold for a year because the town was going to get crushed and the town right. didn't get crushed. Correct. We got some help. We did get some help. And I think um, also, I think if, if at any year we need to support our schools, I mean, the staff at, at the administration and the faculty have done an amazing job under immense pressure and whole new everything. I mean, it's just a really hard year to teach and service the kids. And I think, next year if any year um it's going to be hard to get you know if we can get back to somewhat normalcy that's the year we really need the staff to be focusing on getting our kids back to where they should be because i believe we're going to see through test results or whatever that there's been a you can't go a whole year like this and not have some step backwards and i hope not i hope everybody's been able to thrive in the remote and the um, the hybrid model, but I think we are going to need to really focus on our kids and we're going to need the staff to do that. And um, so it's going to be a tough year to really invest in the schools to get back to where we need to be once once we can get it all clear. So we'll fight for that. Okay. Well, any other? Well, yeah, I just wanted to say, um, so I feel like this is a small part, not small, but part of a larger discussion of the whole budget. So even though, I mean, administratively, you've looked at the whole budget and, and you kind of know where you're going, but I don't know where you're going. And obviously we're not part of those discussions for moving things around as Tina suggested, you know, maybe um, some different kinds of staffing patterns, not necessarily, I'm not saying to cut staff to make the budget work so that we don't have to use school choice. But I'm just saying, we're, I don't feel like I have enough information for everything that's probably been looked at. We didn't, we were kind of, again, um, this is not the normal February budget. We looked at this and say, we really, we're not presenting any staffing numbers in reduction numbers because we don't have them solid yet. But I think if I was to say next step forward is I would ask Trevor, the first question is, when does the town expect our budget? Mm -hmm. And then the follow-up question that would be our next meeting would be talking about the best numbers we have right now projecting four classes next year with what we would bring to the next meeting. And then we talk about, um, you know, programming that way. Yeah. And I would say that um, Monday, uh, Monday the 8th at 5 o'clock, um, the town is finally going to get together with our capital planning 
committee, um, Jen's on, and um, and our finance committee uh, to, to really just get our first sit down to kind of go, okay, well, these are our debts. You know, we have some land we have to pay off. We're still paying on the school roof. Um, what are we going to do with these things? We've got the sewer project. So there's a lot of big um, expenses, a lot of capital requests this year. So it's, a, a, it's really our first time to kind of sit down together, not in the same room, but on Zoom like this. And really kind of have a discussion of what we're going to do and where what the pictures looks like. Revenue looks pretty good. Um, I mean, we're in a lot better shape than we probably feared. Uh, I think for revenue, as far as the town goes, you know, our, we reduced a lot of what the, what we were going to expect for local receipts and different things that we normally count on for revenue. But even those targets, they're pretty good and people have paid, you know, most of their first half of their taxes. So, you know, we're, we're, the town's in okay shape. Uh, now we just have to figure out what we're going to do for for uh, capital expenditures that, for the year, and and everybody's just kind of putting their budgets together. So we're not late by any means. Every we're push town meeting off. We don't even really have a date yet for that. We're hoping certainly in the spring, you know, when it's warmer, and hopefully, you know, we're better shaped to get outside. Um, you know, certainly before July, uh, but um, but but anyways, pushed off a little bit. So we do, I think, have some time. A month or so to kind of get rolling and that will probably i'll we'll discuss a bit where we're at at that meeting with the school uh with the finance committee and stuff because it'll be the first time to talk with them um about where the school's at what we're what we're grappling with what the problems are so you know start start to discuss that a little bit with them and then you know and then maybe try to have some more conversation here to figure out what we can do thank you sure do we have anything else for Shelly and Tina and Darius to consider going forward? <clears throat> do, do the monies just get reallocated um, uh, back and forth from school choice for the 21 budget or do you need some kind of a vote? Um, I don't think we need a vote. I, you guys may have voted on formally moving it last year, but I don't know that it's necessary. Um, I think we may have taken a vote to to affirm your your recommendations, yeah. Um, yeah. which is probably a good good idea, so that yeah. we know that we touched base on the subject and um, the school committee was in agreement with the the plans that were made. So, yeah. Yeah. and I think as the you know next couple of months go on and we see spending hopefully decreasing, that number you know, that I'm predicting is going to grow. And so we will at some point be able to move more, I think, than the 90,000 we're talking about right now. Okay, well, that would be good. So, <clears throat> okay. Well, thank you, Shelly. Um, we, uh, we can move on in the agenda now. Yeah. And um, I don't know if we, do you, Darius, do we need Shelly anymore this evening or? Or do you need her for another meeting? <laughs> I know she's got a lot on her plate these days. Yes. So if she wants to head on out, it's great yeah. seeing you, Shelly, and good luck yeah, with all that's going on. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, new business, Deerfield Academy donation. Vote. Very grateful. Thank you for that letter, Ken. Mm -hmm. So do we... Uh, we can take a formal vote to accept the generous stuff. Excuse me. Ah, these people have been driving me crazy. <laughs> the new car warranty for you. And I, I heaven knows what it is. It's a 617 area code, and the number changes every flipping day. So I block <laughs> them and report them as spam. And they keep coming back 24 or 48 hours later. They're back at you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so I would entertain a motion to uh, accept with uh, deepest appreciation, a gift that was made by Deerfield Academy to the frontier regional and Deerfield schools uh, to help defray um, school lunch program expenses. I, I or, or but take Mary so moved and I'll second that Mary. Any other discussion? Just very grateful. Very mm -hmm. grateful. 
Thank you. Hearing none, all those in favor. Uh, no, I can't say that. Ken Cutterback, yes. <laughs> David Sharp. Yes. Carrie Etchells. Yes. Mary Raymond. Yes. Trevor McDaniel. Yes. It is unanimous. Thank you very much. Yes. And uh, then we have a review of the NASDAQ enrollment projections, which is kind of a nice segue from the conversation we just had about enrollments. <laughs> yeah, you say that, but you know, I went through the, the enrollment projections and I don't find the data very helpful. I and, don't either. It's and so, so and it's been kind of continuously not being helpful. And I, I, I'm considering um, leaving, um, you know, letting our membership expire at the end of this year with NESDIC. Um, mm -hmm. you know, right now, NISDIC does, they provide this service, they provide searching services for superintendent and whatnot. We didn't use, I don't believe we used NISDIC in the no. previous, prior to me search. I think we used another group. I think we used MASC, I think, on, on that particular search. Um, and I really just really say, I mean, they get that they, they put some interesting data, but it's just not real relevant to the way our communities work mm -hmm. in the sense it has frontier growing by like 80 students in two years. Yeah. Uh, no, it's not going to, it's just not, um, you know, um, I don't know where they're getting those, where those kids are coming from, but they're not in our elementary schools. Um, you know, so there's, you know, there's, there's some blatant ones in there. I mean, it gives us some birth rates and that kind of stuff, but every year is a, a crapshoot based on where kids are going that it's not helpful where, where it may have been in like in the seventies and eighties when I think they were, you know, trying, we use this to help sell the school and how many people were supposed to be in here. <laughs> um, I remember you saying something about that, or somebody was saying. Was saying the only thing that's really kind of interesting I, I, it was just the last two years of data. You know, like a ten percent growth. You know, last this is for Frontier, ten percent growth, and then a minus, you know, five and a half this year. Um, I, I don't know. And then you look out. You know, they've got us. you like you said, growing out to twenty thirty. Um, you know, like 400 students, and uh, I, I have no idea how they know that, and it's just kind of, kind of odd. But um, no, I, I agree with you. I don't, I don't know what it costs to be long, but I'm not sure. It's 2,500 dollars. Yeah, that we split up on all the all four towns and such. Right. Uh, so anyway, so I'm, I'm bringing up each group. I've also I had some side conversation with other superintendents and saying I'm missing something here. Am I just not? processing yeah. the data right or am I not using it right and my initial query with the veteran in the area said no I find their data to be interesting at times but I've never really used it as a cornerstone to any decision making and it's mm -hmm. cut a lot of money for that I mean the data that we send them the data and they put it in a chart for us I mean so we actually have the data so <laughs> there's a part of it's part of the data not obviously all the data but right. um, you know we go the birth we try to figure out what our next size of our kindergarten class. I don't say, hang on, Tina. Let me look at the NASDAQ report. Um, prepare to have three teachers. I mean, we're not using yeah. it that way, you know. So mm -hmm. anyway, so but it, yep. it is a document we provided every year. So I wanted to make sure you got it and you can yep. look through it. Well, well, thank you for providing it. <laughs> um, so any other questions on that? The NASDAQ. I'm not seeing any hands go up, so we can move on. Reports. The chair has no report at this point in time or committee. Um, just a second, Trevor. Yeah. Um, Carrie, you did submit the interim director's report. Do um, you have any other comments or? No, nothing beyond that. Okay. Um, Trevor. You had your hand up. Yeah, just to understand, I think I've got this, but the faculty and staff appointments for Deerfield, uh, the name on the left-hand side is the new person, correct? And the replacement, new, I just hard to follow what this is. It says newer replacement. I assume they're replacing the people in the middle of that report. So the new the, the new employees on the left, and then they're replacing the people in the middle. Is that correct? How that works? That's correct, Trevor. Okay, thank you. Yep, it's just trying to understand that. Okay. Principals, re principals report. 
you want to make one or do you just want us to read yours? <laughs> yeah, he, he, you want to go ahead and read that, but I can let you know that we're closing in our fourth week of in-person instruction and we've had a, a couple adjustments along the way, but it seems to be going smooth. And I want to thank um, even our, everybody, because it's been a team effort, but even our town who has had to help us with uh, different plowing, you'd be surprised what goes into getting us all back here in person. So to be gaining some educational momentum and you know thanks big shout out to the community for that and then you have the k through two update on the chromebook mm -hmm. it's nice to see the chromebooks finally arrive yeah. <laughs> <laughs> geez i didn't look uh did we have a snow day yesterday <laughs> no we had a remote day we had a remote day Okay. So, we had a half day on Monday, so they right. got to go out and play all afternoon. Yeah. Not everybody, not everybody agreed with my decision. You I wouldn't believe it. I just can't believe it. I never had that problem when I had to make those decisions. So <laughs> it's nice to see the snowmen in the neighborhood. So I'm glad so, they're all time. Yes. Well, please do pass on our thanks to the staff and and everyone involved with this tremendous work on, on being in person. Um, I know that there's a significant part of the parent population that is very happy to be back in person. Um, and uh, hopefully we continue to roll on and have good things to report. Thank you. So superintendent's report. No, I just had the pool testing and vaccinations coming. That's all I have right now. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I go back a second? I'm sorry to be a broken record. I think I've asked this before, but curious. What are the other elementaries doing? Are they also aware? Teaching and learning? No. Um, <laughs> yeah, all the other. Um, right now, Waitley is back four days a week. Conway is back four days a week. Sunderland is back four days. They have their most vulnerable learners for back four days a week, but it Statistically, the number of students they have back four days a week is about the same, um, but they got to remember per percentage-wise to what they have. They're, they're at like a 45-55 um, split for remote versus hybrid, so they had some other struggles there. So, um, so the other ones have come back, but I will say that you know Deerfield really did take the torch of getting everybody back as quickly as possible for four days a week. They they ones did a transition. Those, two, those schools were kind of transitioning in, in a much smaller population, so. It really was a Herculean task by Tina and, and her cool leadership team and crew getting it happening over there. It's a, it's a very different you know, number of students and number of people involved versus single classroom, and the smaller ones. Um, it's, just, it's just a lot more to coordinate. I mean, I think everybody and everybody had to do is doing the work and the hard work there, but I'm just saying in the sense of the, just the size of the building and, and getting it going and started has been was impressive. So. <laughs> Is, it, is this pretty unique to Franklin County, what Deerfield is doing? I mean, sorry, well, Union 38 at this point, but. Yeah. That's, yeah, mm -hmm. and same with Hampshire County, it's, right? It's unique. It's unique in a sense of since September. Um, Franklin County has um, a lot of districts, there's a lot of districts struggling to get their, their doors open for whatever the many different factors that, you know, we struggled with along the way too. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, there's different hangups in different communities of why they've been able to open, why they're not. Sometimes it's just bad luck where they tried to open and they had cases. Sometimes it's, you know, they have association issues, other things, building issues with, you know, HVAC. You go right down each superintendent's different story. Um, we also have amazing leadership here, so that it kind of helps with yeah. school committees that also helps. Um, and now, no joke though, we do have, we've had really good school committees that are, um, there are a lot of veterans in our school committees compared to neighboring towns where people are, you know, um, I didn't approach the same way. To the south, however, to, to what you're saying, David, is that um, Hampshire County, there's a mix. There's some that have um, caught up. There's some that have been open since September in a hybrid model. And if you go down to Hamden County, um, there are some districts that really uh, were able to open early on. They had a longer term of closure when they went red. Um, but I'm thinking like your Agwams and your um, Long Meadows. I forget when Long Meadow got back, but 
not Springfield and not, you know, Holyoke, but some of those other kind of surrounding communities, they kind of went back early as well. So it's kind of a mix. Each district has its own kind of story. It's very yep. interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very proud of the district. Yes. Sure. Um, you should be proud of the team, Darius, yeah. very definitely. Absolutely. So, um, no executive session to, to necessary this evening, so we are down to adjournment. If someone would care to make a motion, if everyone wants to be quiet, then we'll sit for a while. So mindfulness is always good. We can do that. Yes, I'll move to adjourn. Okay. No second. And T second. second. And Ken Cutterback, yes. David Sharp, yes. Carrie Etchells. Mary Raymond. Yes. And Trevor McDaniel. Yes. Thank you all very much. Yes, and uh, we are officially adjourned at 7.15 p.m.